Train the muscles, not the joints. Welcome back to Natural Goliath Bodybuilding and here's another live workout. Now I'm not sure, I might split this into two different parts because some of you guys don't want to sit around and watch the same video uh, even though I'm doing different body parts or whatever. But I'm going to start off with some chest and some of you guys are like, oh why aren't you training legs in the live workout? Well the reason why is because I like to talk in between sets and when I'm training legs, uh, you know at least if I'm filming myself, there's not really a lot of talking going on in between sets when I'm doing legs. So. <laughs> It's a little bit harder for uh, live stuff as far as me to give you my thoughts on certain subjects and stuff. So yeah, so what I'm gonna do is some dumbbell presses today, some flat dumbbell presses. And then I'll move into a little bit of inclines and then uh, you know some specialty type movements just for fun and uh, see what happens. And then from there I'll move into my back training and my bicep training. So yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. A lot of times I like to go really like slow and maybe two or three sets sometimes on the really light dumbbells. Sometimes I go lighter than 70s, right? So I'm not trying to show off here. I'm just like, depending on how I feel that day, but I feel so pumpy and lumpy lately that 70s are like, it's like nothing, man. Yeah. I had a lot of yams yesterday, just so you know. Or not yams, but sweet potatoes. And holy shit, chicken and yams. And chicken and sweet potatoes just taste so good. So I probably overdid my carbs yesterday. And somebody was asking me about uh, carb intake and how much, how much carbs I actually have. Honestly, I don't know. Because I don't have a scale and I need to weigh the cooked sweet potatoes or uh, stuff like that. Like, I can kind of give you an idea when I'm doing the pasta because it's on the package, like a fifth of the package is about 60 grams of protein or so. Or I mean 60 grams of carbs. And... Uh, same with the oatmeal, right? I know how much I weigh that or I measure it before I make it. And uh, get my breath here for a second. And because I have all the you know macros on the package, it's a lot easier. But because yams, there's it just says one medium yam has a certain amount of carbs. Uh, well, what's a medium yam? I don't know, like medium based on that package or what, I have no idea. So I have to start, uh, I have to get a scale really to know, but I'm guessing I'm around 250 to 400 grams of carbs sometimes, just depends. But my protein intake is definitely around 200 to 210, at least yesterday it was. Sometimes it's around 170, 180. And I'm just, I'm just counting the protein from meat and eggs and whey protein. I'm not counting any protein from, you know, rice or oatmeal or, you know, any of that stuff. I'm not counting those as protein sources. So gives you an idea where I'm at anyway. But yeah, no, it feels good at those yams. Or I mean, those sweet potatoes. I keep calling them f yams. I don't know. Anyway, those sweet potatoes are really good. Man. But the one thing that people forget is that, and I'm trying to say this, but sometimes I never come up with the right words, but the diet does a lot of the work for you, right? If your diet's on point, when you're training, all of a sudden it feels like the muscles are contracting properly. It feels like something's happening. But when you're not uh, eating properly, it seems like everything's dead. Like things are just not working right. 
So basically the diet helps wake up all these areas, right? Helps make sure there's proper blood flow. And that's a, that's a good part of it. So I forgot to turn on the other camera, but you will get two camera angles in this one too, just so you know. So don't, don't feel like you're missing out, okay? So I like to work out in my garage and then I watch people walk by, I walk their dogs all day. And I live in a more of a retirement type area. So I think I scare the shit out of half these older guys. They like, who is that guy in this garage? Grunting. But yeah, so diet is underestimated and always has been uh, by most people. And it was by me for the first seven or eight years of my training, I underestimated diet. It's crazy how much of a difference it makes. And uh, the minute you, you know, lower the fat down. So, so you want to have a minimal amount of fat, like, you know, 20 to 40, 50 grams a day, depending on, you know, where you're at. But you don't need a boatload of fat. And that's the thing, like just because fat can be essential and omega-3s are better than, uh, you know, uh, than saturated in a lot of cases, right? It doesn't mean that having a boatload of fat is gonna be good for you. A lot of times it can work for a bulk, but I find if anything, it just bogs me down. And I, I end up getting bigger, but also fatter. And I don't get that pumpy and lumpy look. But if you want that bodybuilder stage kind of look and to feel a lot of energy, I say carbs, like good quality, lower glycemic carbs and protein are, are just a better bet, right? So eating the oatmeal, I've been eating some rice too. Like rice is not necessarily low glycemic index, but this still is a good complex carb. And then I, I eat some sweet potatoes and I kind of go back and forth. So it's not like I'm uh, just doing one thing, I'm changing it all the time. But I'm trying to find out where that sweet spot is, no pun intended, with sweet potatoes. <clears throat> Okay, I think this will be good. All right, here we go. I got the hundreds here. I only have 100 pound dumbbells. That's the most I have. So I just talked to a company and ordered 120. So I'll be doing a review on that if uh, they turn out to be as good as they look. So once they come, I'll do a review on the 120 pound dumbbells and Hopefully I can lift them by the time they show up. Hopefully that happens, so we'll see. <laughs> okay. Light, Ooh, it's good. Oh. Okay. Yeah, one, one hundred feel pretty light actually. It's a good sign. Pumpy and lumpy, okay? Right? So that's that's what it looks like. So I usually take about a minute, minute and a half in between sets, you know, unless I'm doing the super light no rest sort of method, right? So that's that's kind of what I go back and forth with. But usually I leave the short rest stuff till the end of my workout or after I've done the heavy stuff, right? Oh. <clears throat> so somebody uh, just asked me why my movements aren't fully locked out or whatever and everything I do is against the research. I'm gonna tell you right now, research, there's so much different research out there and so much of it is limited and not even telling you the truth on any level whatsoever. So I always laugh when people come on my channel and they say, you're doing everything wrong, but yet you've got results that I want. How does that make sense? I don't understand how people <laughs> come up with shit. But the other thing they, understand, they misunderstand is that I'm built a certain way, right? So they'll say, hey, you should come down lower when you've been overall, right? So my arm comes down to here, 
And I think, okay, make it go down lower. Well, my army, as you can see, it doesn't go lower. That's just the way I'm built, right? And also, when you have muscle, sometimes it makes it look like your range of motion is shorter than it is. So, like a lot of the guys like Ronnie Coleman or a lot of the pros train a certain way and then people all, you know, in the comments, oh, you're training all wrong and that's, uh, you know, you should be doing it this way. And that, because they're, they're looking at skinny people with no muscle and saying, wow, your movement should look exactly like the skinny guy's movement, but it's, it's not gonna look exactly the same. When you put on muscle, it just looks different, you know? So I think there's a lot of uh, bodybuilder discrimination going on there. Okay, so I know some of you guys might be getting scared right now, but don't be scared, okay? You know, I was filming in the forest the other day, and, uh, and animals were so scared, they actually, they, they died and, and became petrified right in front of me. Here's a clip. I don't know what happened to this guy. Uh, what do you think? Hmm, poor guy. Do you guys want that? I, I got, I got it. I got it. Four thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. I will send you raccoon ass, and it's 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 authentic, authentic raccoon ass, and you can make like a hat out of it or something. I mean. So yeah, don't, don't let this happen to yourself. It's uh, it's just needless. You know what I'm saying? It's just needless. All right, let's just move this camera over here. Get a different shot, yeah. Different shot. All right. Let's see what we got going on here, man. You, uh... So yeah, let me know uh, when you're listening to this stuff or when you're watching this YouTube video. Like, uh, do you find this works well for you when you're training at home or when you're at the gym, you're just trying to kind of get a pace or what? Or if you're just uh, eating your breakfast, you know? Of the right type of food, of course. Whatever that might be for you at this time. So I don't stretch a lot before my workouts. Sometimes I'll stretch like lightly to make sure nothing's tight. But the most important thing is to get the blood flow there. And uh, doing the movements you're going to do, like sports specific training, but super light and slow, and just make sure that everything is firing on all cylinders, right? And if you need to do a couple extra sets of warm-ups, don't worry about that. I mean, the whole thing is, you know, that as a general rule, I'd say don't take yourself to absolute failure, and therefore you're going to have strength once you get into the strength sets, but it's not like a hard and fast rule, right? If you find that you have to go deeper into the burn in order to get the proper warm-up, well, then do that, right? The first thing and the most important thing is prevention of injury. Second is what's the most effective for building muscle, right? And then you try to bridge the gap between the two. Okay, next set here.
I wasn't getting tired there. That's uh, that's usually the dumbbells, right? I'm gonna move this here. You guys get a different angle here. Wow. Because the dumbbells get tired, I have to stop the set. And uh, I know it sounds totally crazy, but that's just the way it works. Yeah, it's just the way it works. When you get really big, when you guys get really big, you're gonna notice that your dumbbells are just gonna like fatigue up on you. You might even need to switch dumbbells just because one set of dumbbells gets tired. And I know it's, it's really frustrating. It's like you need a set of tag team dumbbells. Like the wrestles, wrestlers, right? Okay, that should be good, yeah. As you can see, the 100s are not super light for me, but a little light, a little light. Like I could go a little heavier, you know, but, uh, but sometimes you got limitations at home, right? So that's the great part about training at a gym, but the home gym just saves me so much time. And at the same time, uh, saves me gas, saves me commute time, saves me, uh, I don't know. I just, it just, I find it just so convenient. Like there's a lot less excuses to train when you have a home gym. Some guy was asking me on the other live uh, workout why I was using wrist straps on my pull-ups. Almost like he was mad about it. Like people are so stupid sometimes. Like, but anyway, the reason why is because when I was doing dumbbell rows with the 105s with no wrist straps, I uh, burned up the forearms pretty good. So they got a good workout. And because I was planning on doing pull-ups but then hanging, from the pull-up bar to get that stretch in the lat and to just get that time under tension. I wanted to make sure that the lats or the back was hitting failure, not my grip first. Because if your grip hits failure first, then it's your grip that's going to adapt, not necessarily your lat muscles or your back muscles, right? So as much as I totally uh, encourage people not to use wrist straps all the time, there are times where it's necessary in order to basically make sure that the lats hit failure because a lot of times your lats can, they can out pull your, your forearms in a lot of cases, right? Especially with heavier weight. And especially if you, especially in some cases, and, and this chin up part doesn't apply, but in cases where you're holding onto a barbell and the barbell can roll out of your hands. So in those cases, your grip has to be even stronger to make sure that you're not losing grip. So yeah, so in those cases, that's what I do. So a lot of times I'll do the first few sets uh, like say I'm using medium weight with forearms, you know, just, just grip with no wraps. Sometimes I'm doing 225 on the bent over row and I'll just use no wraps and, and I don't care if the forearms hit failure first, just because I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to work the forearms a bit, but then there are times where I'm really adamant about the back hitting failure. And then that's where the wrist straps will come in because I know that my grip is just more limited or weaker than my back is, you know? So yeah, that's, that's why a lot of times you see deadlifters when they're doing, you know, grip type deadlifts, they do a alternate grip, which can be dangerous on the bicep tendons, but that's why they do that is to prevent the rolling of the bar out of their hands. All right, next set here, let's do two more sets.
got to check to make sure this camera's still going because it has a 30 minute time limit. Let's give myself another minute here and then do the last set of flat and then we'll move into some sort of incline stuff. Oh. What other questions were asked this week that were kind of funny? Oh, there was a guy on my, uh, there was a guy on my YouTube page that was uh, mad because I call myself a natural bodybuilder. And he was thinking it was, he was trying to say it was some sort of virtuous way of saying things. And, and although I do believe that I, I made the smarter decision in life to stay as a drug-free bodybuilder and to stay natural, that uh, it has nothing to do with virtue. It's not like I'm looking down on anybody, but it is important for people to understand that uh, to do something naturally is a much harder thing than unnaturally. So the reason why I have to say natural is because I am and because that totally changes the level of what I accomplished comparatively speaking to a guy that cheated, right? And people need to understand that, especially if I'm trying to teach natural people how to be natural, it only stands the reason I should let them know that I'm natural, right? So yeah, you get all sorts on YouTube, right? You get all sorts of this kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of funny. Everybody's got a, not everybody, but a lot of people have a certain pissing contest where they're just, they're so uh, insecure that they have these weird issues that go on, you know, weird games. So, good thing I got my garage gym and, and as much as I can do this camera stuff, I can just delete. If I don't like a comment, delete. <laughs> also the other people, you get the other people on there that just spam your page because they're trying to build their own Instagram or YouTube following or whatever. And it's like, okay. It's like walking into somebody else's store and saying, hey, I got some better shit to sell. Just come to my store down the street. You know what I mean? It's just, just funny. People are funny. <clears throat> All right. There's some. I can feel a pump coming on. Can you feel the pump? I can feel the pump coming on. Hopefully you guys are feeling a pump right now too. You're training, you're getting a pump. All full of sweet potatoes. Chicken and sweet potato pump. Chicken and sweet potatoes. Okay, that's good. Oh yeah. As you can see, I reached that critical drop-off point that I talk about. Well, all of a sudden the reps go down like 25% or so. And that's usually when I start having that happen, that's usually when I change exercises or I move to something else. So that's usually how I determine how many sets I should do. But in the end, that's really when I'm trying to push it and I have a lot of energy. But in the end, you know, three sets to five sets can still produce a lot of results and more volume isn't always necessarily better. Sometimes it's detrimental if you don't have the right resources, you know, your food's not on point, your sleep's not on point, that kind of thing. So don't worry about it if uh, you're not feeling motivated to do as many sets. Okay. All right, let me see, back this up here. See if you guys can see me properly. All right. So I'll start with a light set because it is a different angle. So I want to make sure I'm ready for that. <clears throat> you always want the body to get used to what it's going to do next, right? Even if it seems simple to you, 
it's never a bad idea just to do a little bit of a walkthrough, you know, like Evil Knievel. You always have to ride up to the ramp a few times before you go into the real big jump, you know? Okay. I think I, I'm gonna go a little lower. What do you think? Do you think I should go lower? You know what? I'll go a little bit higher. A little higher today, fuck it. Sorry, I swore on live television. Oh, yeah, pumpy and lumpy, eh? Feeling pumpy and lumpy. So yeah, I'll do a couple sets. I think a couple sets, but it might be more, but I think a couple sets of the hundreds, and then, uh, and then we'll move on to some back, if you guys are still around. So yeah, a lot of guys say the old school bodybuilders used to do the fat and protein thing. And I, I disagree, honestly, because when I read a lot of the old books like Arnold Schwarzenegger encyclopedias and the, there was this other one, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like, it was a long time ago I read it, like when I was a kid. I have it upstairs actually, but it was like, there was a lot of guys that they were doing the carbs and protein and then some fat, but lower fat. And muscle and fitness, it was always about lower fat, not high, high fat, right? Now the difference is, I'm gonna say, and before you guys can test what I'm saying here, the difference is, is that a lot of the guys would do the fat and protein when they wanted to drop some water for a photo shoot and they would fat load. So that way the veins would come out and stuff the day before. But what works for water retention and within 24 hours to look a little bit better is not always, and a lot of times it isn't the way at all that a person got in shape in the first place, you see? So that's where the, the, all these uh, misunderstandings come from. And uh, I noticed that when I did a lot of fat and protein to get ready for the natural worlds and the WMBF, I looked like dog shit. Like I just didn't, I didn't get lean enough because the fats were just bringing in so much calories. And, and uh, even though I was taking in mostly omega threes and stuff, I looked pretty big, but I just couldn't get lean enough. It was like, I always had that little bit of a film. Now somebody could say, Hey, just lower your calories. Okay. But when I did the same thing with carbs, and had as much carbs as I wanted, I looked leaner and better and fuller in some way. So there's, there's positives to both diets, but as a general rule, carbs play a huge, huge, huge role in offsetting uh, you know, protein or catabolism, right? Like when your body eats the protein. And also they play a role in offsetting uh, heat, like we call it pitta in Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, they get rid of heat or inflammation in some way. And uh, yeah, they also help blood flow. Like if you have too much fat, your blood flow kind of slows down like gravy. At least that's what happens with me. So again, you always have to take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt as far as it's always about amounts. But if I just go all out and just eat good quality complex carbs and protein, everything's automated. I feel better. I get fuller. I get bigger. People are like, wow, what happened to you? Why are you getting bigger? But when I eat fat and, and, uh, and protein, what happens is people are like, oh, you're kind of big, but yeah, you, you're sure. About time you went on a cut, you know, you should lean up a little bit, you know? So you can kind of tell sometimes, well, by other people's observations too, right? Somebody asked me how to get the dumbbells up when you're on an incline. I just bring the dumbbells close to the waist or actually medium, medium of the thigh. I just use my calves to kick them off the ground. And then I just roll them up, see, just like that. Okay. Yeah, it's not that hard, see? I just, uh, the secret is to roll, right? Just to, I use the calf, right? Like I push off the ground with my calf and then roll, roll it up into position. So it's pretty easy. At least for my body dimensions. I know some guys are built different, so maybe they need to find a different way to do it. Oh, that feels pretty good. I might actually do two sets of that. I don't know, that, that's the other thing. The other thing I'm gonna say about diet. When your diet's on point, your mind muscle connection is better, but you also end up getting a stronger contraction, not just from feeling the muscle, but you, but it's like a totally different level of depth. So 
when I'm doing the inclines and my diet is on point, I actually feel my chest. When my diet's not on point, I feel a lot more delt and not necessarily my chest, right? So some muscles have to be carved up or have glycogen in them in order for their optimal activation to happen. So that's something you don't hear from anybody. They always talk about just eating this, eating that, and then the glycogen thing that naturally happens. Well, if you're not eating starch and you're waiting for your body to produce that glycogen from the fat, it's a slower process and it's not necessarily optimal for fullness, which is why every bodybuilder carbs up before shows, right? If it didn't help in giving that full look, then they wouldn't do it. So, you know, this is, this is it. And I noticed this back in the day when I was getting ready for the natural universe. I was killing myself for that diet. I was like, okay, I'm going to get lean no matter what, right? I'm going to cut my carbs down, just live on my chicken, asparagus, broccoli, and uh, tuna and egg white shakes and, you know, shit sideways because my digestion was so bad. <laughs> and at the same time stink up my entire house and <laughs> whatever, because it just was not agreeing with me. But I got lean, I got really, really lean. But what I noticed was that after three or four days with very little carbohydrates, my body started to look fatter, right? Not only were the muscles flattening out, but I actually looked fatter, like there was something else that was going on. And only after I had a day or so or two of carbohydrates did all of a sudden my muscles start to look good again and full. So I noticed there was this balance I had to have when I was trying to get ready for contest of fullness. And then from there depletion a little bit to get some of the excess water out. But if I didn't have carbs at all, I actually looked worse. I just looked small and flat. So uh, that, that's where I really found out that carbohydrates were absolutely necessary in, in, in my case, for sure. I mean, maybe somebody else is gonna find something a little bit different, but they were necessary for optimal muscle mass. One more. One more set, do one more set. So yeah, that's, that's why our, um, that's where competing kind of helped for me to understand uh, some of the subtleties that you don't see when you're sitting at 10% body fat or 20% or body fat. Once you're down to lower fat levels, you really start to see how the body is using food immediately, right? And you see the side effect of depletion you know, really quickly as well. Whereas when you have that fat buffer, you don't see it as much. So you don't have to refine the diet to perfection the same way. So, if I was going to say any benefit of competing, that was one, one of the benefits. Would I say that uh, competing is for everybody and it's a great way to make a living? I'd say, yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's like not really the best thing to do. It's like uh, putting all your priority into something that doesn't give you any return. <laughs> of course, in this day and age, uh, there's a little bit more potential for social media following and, and all that. But uh, when I was doing it, it was... It was like a hobby that you were constantly trying to make into some sort of living, but it was a grind. I tell you, it was a grind. Lots of ups and downs, you know, but it was good though. I mean, I achieved quite a bit. Uh, so in that way, it was at least something that I can look back on and say, hey, at least I did something. But, but yeah, was it an easy path? No, it was not an easy path to, to train, work out and always be broke and uh, dealing with bills and stuff and always robbing Peter to pay Paul to, to just pay for your flights and your hotels and stuff to go to different competitions or do a photo shoot and stuff. They're good experiences, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, um, it was stressful at times, let's put it that way. So in this day and age, it's so much easier. I mean, people can just, you know, market themselves so much easier just from their own garage like this. 
instead of have to uh, go out there. Like, you know, and in, in that way, it's harder as well in a different way because now there's so much more competition too, right? Like fame meant something more back in the 80s and 90s than it does now. Now it's like the average 11 year old playing Minecraft is, is famous, you know what I mean? Like, so the funny thing is, is that if, you, uh, if, if you're famous now, it's like because there's so many people that are famous and people are being inundated with so much content, it's really difficult to stand out in a different way. Whereas before it was more like you had to go and have connections with the photographers or you know, knock on some doors. Now it's almost like everybody's got the same potential to meet the same people. Now it's a, now it's a big uh, slugfest, right? So <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? All right, last set of these. So this is a movement, this is a movement I've been doing that is, you could say it's a more cosmetic type movement, but, but I do it for a number of different reasons. One is to stretch the neck out, get some good stretch and trap in there. The other is to get a little bit of the clavicular heads of the upper pec. And, uh, and I find just doing this movement helps get the pump in there. It also works a lot of front delts too, for sure. But I find because I'm flaring the elbows, I'm getting a good like neck tie-in plus upper chest uh, rehabilitation sort of nice burn, nice pump, you know? So I'm doing this not as a heavy movement, obviously. I think heavy, this would probably destroy your shoulder joints. It's, it's really a good thing, especially for me. I find it's really good just to do light. It's really just an exclusively light movement. Let me just adjust the camera here so it's easier for you to see me. Okay. There we go, okay. So yeah, I'm just doing like, okay. I'm just doing 30 pounds. I do allow the shoulders to roll forward like this. That stretches my traps out quite a bit. And I like that, I don't mind it at all actually. You never get big enough traps. Sometimes I find with the movement that, sometimes I find with the movement if I go to here, I get more trap, but if I get this last little bit, I get a bit more upper chest. So it's worth it to uh, do that little bit of extra range, you know, at least in my case, it might be different for you, but that's what I'm noticing. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So. Yeah, one of the things about training is that it's not an exact science for everybody. It's not always the same, same principles, right? But this is a movement I never did my whole life. I'm just doing this this last three weeks as an experiment and it just feels good, you know, there's something. So that's why really the main point of this channel is to get you feeling your body so that way you can recognize positive experiences 
or negative experiences and then build upon your own personal program from there, you know? So my workout programs on my website are great templates to get you to start connecting. But if you're feeling burnt out and you don't know what to do, I would say start with my Body Bliss program on my website because it's nice and light, it's easy, but it's focusing just on your awareness. Just simplify everything, just become aware. Everything starts with that, and that's the most important thing. And then as that awareness grows, you'll start to see some things work, some things don't, but you'll know immediately based on your own awareness, you'll be able to feel, oh, okay, I'm not even feeling any muscles with this, or I'm just feeling isometric contraction as opposed to uh, isotonic contraction. You know, there's a difference between just holding a weight and, and flexing as opposed to contraction and stretch. You know what I'm saying? So this, this awareness is king. That's it, right? And also being able to meet the pain, you know, because even though pains, there's some good pains and some bad pains, even the good pains, they hurt a lot and they're hard to meet sometimes. So. So that concludes the chest part of our workout, the chest part of the real time or live workout, but it's really real time workout. And if you wanna check out the next workout, that's gonna be back. So we'll be putting the back portion of this workout on here. So make sure you tune into part two. Motion. And if you need to get a hold of me, go to naturalgolandbodybuilding.com. And, and thanks to the Patreon supporters, where I'm doing a podcast every single week on this sort of stuff and talking about this sort of thing. Kind of like we're doing right here in these live casts, but even more in depth. Motion. Natural land.